so we're going to um, be watching Cy load and fire the cannon that he made. It's a Revolutionary War type. It looks like something you would see on a pirate ship. So I made this, I would say, eight years ago in this shop, complete. Every piece, every part, the design is his, the machine work is all his, the blacksmith fittings and components are all his. The, the, the trails, which are the wooden components, are black walnut. The, the axle and the wheels he got from another source, but the gun, the mechanism of the gun, is all made on site. Eleven years ago when I first met Cy, the rifling machine that he made is a piece of three-quarter by three-quarter solid. He come out here, he said, come out here and help me put a twist in this. Uh, 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 okay. I went out there, we put a crescent wrench on opposite ends of a four-foot piece of three-quarter by three-quarter solid, and he and I twisted it cold right out in the middle of the air. He went to the left, I went to the right. One full revolution, and that, that's, that's the, that registers the twist in the barrel with the machine that he made. Had to do it cold so the twist would be uniform because the heat might not be a uniform yeah, right, right, heat. Right, right, right. We could have done a gain twist, but I didn't want to do it. Yeah. In fact, if I was going to build one with a gain twist, but that's, I'm not going to build it's anymore. It's cannon. So this is patterned off Revolutionary War, essentially. Yeah, sort of. It's not an exact copy, but it's representative. Except it, for the sights and except for, Except for the sights, adjustable sights, which Cy made. And except for the breech plug, which they didn't have. They didn't have breech plugs like this. They just loaded it from the barrel. Right. Yeah. There's four pieces of steel in the barrel, and he turned the different patterns, concentric of course. So when you're sweating on an exterior piece onto an interior piece, the rule of thumb is one and a half thousandths of interference per inch of diameter on your, on your cylindrical pieces. So this piece is only held on by the tension of the shrink. And where the next piece occurs here. This whole section. This whole section is also sweated on to this. And then this, this is the size of the original tube. Original stock right there, mm -hmm. taper. This is welded on. No, it's shrunk on. That's shrunk on also and then a fillet weld or yeah. just, yeah. No, so, actually this is turned. That's turned, so that's a, just a turned fillet radius. radius. Shrunk on, band, turned for the, for the radius. Gradual taper, shrunk on. All of these decorative bands turned on his lathe. Turn the taper turn the taper after the pieces have been assembled, turn the breech plug, cut the threads, make the sight, adjusting screw, black walnut trails, forge the straps, machine the brass nuts, nice touch, they need to be polished. Actually one of the trickiest things was making the cutter that threaded the inside of this brass nut. Those are acme screws essentially? Yes. Yeah. Making a cutter for acme screws. a cutter to grind to cut that inside thread. A fair piece. These other pieces are just for assembly. Hmm. Hooks for the ropes. One thing that that is very trick on here, if you if you notice there's no weld on the trunnions, hmm. I cut the diameter or the radius of these trunnions to the radius of this on the mill and then welded inside of them and then plugged them so they look solid. Yeah. The wheels and axles came from a different source, but it's just really a splendid. It was a hundred year old wagon. A hundred year old wagon is where those parts came from. From <laughs> Montana? Yep. Yeah. Projectile, charge of powder, fuse. Got that? Your hammer's right here. Now watch this, because he's he, he's not sissy hitting it. Okay.
Go get Helga, will you? What? Get what? Helga. What's Helga? Helga. Steve didn't know who Helga was. You hadn't met Helga? Hey. Helga. <laughs> Pokes a hole in the aluminum foil mm. so the fuse goes directly into the powder because he knows exactly where the powder is yeah. and he's got a lighter. Will that pick up the crosshairs in the front oh. side? about <laughs> 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 that was closer to 50 feet <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see the splash oh <laughs> it had to be over 50 feet yeah it got up there uh This is made for the, the bigger cannon, and this is the base that makes the hollow mm -hmm. base in this mold, which is very dirty. Anyhow, it goes together like this. This clamp clamps into this flat part like that. <coughs> you screw that in there, and you fill it full of lead. And then, and then you shear this off, mm -hmm. take it out, knock it out, make another one. And it doesn't really make good bullets until the mold gets up five, oh. seven hundred degrees. It's it's better after. It is to its true size. Is this steel? No, it's aluminum. Oh, aluminum. And you man and you manufactured those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Make them on a lathe. There's also out there. There's a round ball round ball mold. How did you determine like the size and the profile of those shells? Or you measure cannon? the bore of the cannon. Not but in terms rifle. of like the, you know, they have like the, you know. I designed that after the Keith Wadcutter bullet that I used to use when I was shooting a lot. Uh -huh. It was very accurate and it cuts a very clean, nice, crisp hole in a target. I can show you some of the targets. Cool. So how does the diameter of the projectile compare to the diameter of the bore of the gun? The diameter of the projectile is just almost identical to the bore of the gun outside of the rifling. In other words, it's, it's tight, but it's not quite as big, but that hollow point, hollow base, I mean, the hollow base of this, as it's fired, expands into the rifling, mm -hmm. and it pushes the skirts of the bullet out into the bore. <laughs> <laughs>